Thank you, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for including me in this really terrific uh, program. Uh, so, um, this project with uh, Eric Talley from Colombia uh, is about the um, tension uh, between long term and short term uh, that occupies a lot of uh, minds currently. So, the uh, Maybe main concern of corporate America right now is how to protect long-term investment and growth. Long-term investments are uh, the goal of our corporations and corporate law. All of the success stories, you know, business success stories are uh, stories of these long-term investments. And the concern is that uh, managers who want to invest in long-term investment and maybe have good ideas, uh, face lots of pressures from markets, from investors, from uh, reporting requirements to perform at the short term and to give money back to shareholders and uh, uh, to show short term results. And that this pressure uh, uh, kind of harm uh, some of uh, the success, the potentially successful uh, long term investments. And. Uh, what we are uh, uh, saying here is not that short-term pressures do not exist. We think that there are short-term pressures in the market. Uh, um, one important source of short-term pressure now is hedge fund activism, who pressure managers to give money back to shareholders. Uh, but uh, rather, what we are saying is that this kind of dichotomic picture of uh, short-term bias markets who want money now uh, and long-term optimal investment are not accurate. Like everything else in life, it's not that black and white. Uh, and in particular, what we are saying is that also the long-term view, the long-term focus, the long-term investments have some problems. And long-term, is also sometimes biased. Why? Because managers uh, who initiate these long-term projects, uh, like every other human being, you know, tend to believe in them, uh, sometimes fall in love with them, uh, uh, have lots of aspirations with respect to these projects, and the projects would materialize uh, only a long, long time from now. So the constraints that uh, uh, people have on overconfidence in businesses and on, on, on uh, you know, hopes and beliefs are really weak when the investment is going to uh, materialize in 10 or 20 years from now. And if this is right, then maybe if managers face no pressures from markets and no pressure from, from hedge funds at all, they might overinvest in these big dreams. And that's, that's really the question. So um, why do, uh, uh, going a little bit more into the details of, of why uh, uh, we think that managers might have this bias of overestimate the prospects of their long-term projects, of their ideas, of their inventions, um, what we are really arguing is that overconfidence, which is uh, uh, experiments have shown most of people have, right? Most people believe that they are better than average on lots and lots of, of skills. And definitely most managers have, as lots of experiments have shown, most managers have, uh, uh, are, are overly optimistic with respect to the success of their potential projects. So um, what we argue is that this overconfidence when we talk about long-term projects, it's stronger, and it's also more influential, and it's also less restrained. So all of these three dimensions are working in favor of overestimating this long-term project that you have, okay? So, uh, Uh, I mainly want to talk about several examples, uh, but, but I'll just give you a kind of a map road before I get to the examples. Uh, and and uh, the work, of course, includes a lot uh, of more discussion of them. But uh, there are different reasons that were found to uh, support and create overconfidence uh, in people. So, for example, people have illusion of control. Managers tend to uh, neglect potential competition. 
then tend to overestimate the um, importance of their own skills, okay? So this project is really fits my skills, and this is why it's going to be successful, and I don't think about all the potential competition that is going to come uh, uh, in the future. And all of these, these factors, when you think about a future project, are kind of uh, stronger. It's harder to anticipate competition in 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, in addition, uh, and that's important, so as, as um, Kahneman and Frosky have shown, uh, overconfidence could be uh, restrained if we look at data. So really the right thing to do is to have what they call the outside view, to go and look at projects that were similar to your own project and see how they did. Look at the distribution of similar projects and see what the results were. This is what uh, uh, we can do to restrain our overconfidence. But not many companies do that. Uh, and with respect to long-term projects, you know, you can also justify for, for yourself why not to do that. There are no really similar projects. It's very hard to find, you know, a comparison group. This is a unique project. Uh, so the, I can't really look at the, there is no relevant data and so forth. So also this restraint of looking at relevant data uh, is weaker when I think about a long-term project. And then when I do get the data, it's usually later in time, after I already invested in it, after I'm, I'm already committed to that, and, and, and at that point, I, I don't really, I tend to misinterpret the data. I tend to uh, 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 have some biases also with how I take this data. So, uh, so we are discussing a few uh, cases, just, just as an examples. Again, we do not think that these are necessarily representative. Uh, uh, we, of course, uh, believe that they are really good long-term projects, and, uh, uh, but we think that uh, these cases also exist, and uh, um, we have to start thinking about them when we think about this trade-off between long-term and short-term. Because right now, we have a really strong assumption about long-term projects, almost an optimality assumption. So let's take the first case, which is the case of uh, Yahoo and Marisa Meyer. Yahoo, uh, hired, Yahoo board hired Marisa Meyer primarily because there was also a very strong uh, internal candidate, but primarily because of her ambitious uh, long-term plan uh, for Yahoo. Uh, Meyer uh, offered to, to the board a plan that could make Yahoo competitive with Facebook and Google. And the internal candidate had kind of a more uh, uh, careful uh, uh, conservative plan, and eventually the board opted for this ambitious plan. Uh, the problem is that these kind of plans are, are common to uh, long-term projects, and, and as we show in the paper, uh, when you have these high prospects, this high upside, even a small uh, 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 mistake, a small overconfidence, uh, a small overestimation of how likely this plan is to succeed could result in a really high deviation uh, in the project value, in a really high overestimation of the project value because the upside is so high. So let's say the 30% likelihood for it to happen, and I, I estimated it 40% because I'm overconfident, the mistake in the overestimation is really large. Uh, and then, Myers' plan also uh, really includes all these this, uh, factors that, that are related to overconfidence. So for example, uh, Myers' plan, initial plan, was built around applications. This was when, when the market for application was not that competitive. It just started. So she offered to make Yahoo uh, 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 um, uh, a producer of, of a content application and mainly a search application that was built around her own skills. Okay? So again, a plan that is built on her own skills, neglecting future competition. Nobody knew what the uh, uh, future market is going to be with uh, apps. And uh, the last component is that Yahoo had lots of money, lots of internal funds coming from Alibaba. And this is also something that was shown in empirical studies to support overconfidence. Overconfident managers uh, tend to invest more when they have a lot of money in the company. 
when they have to raise capital from outside, they invest less. So uh, uh, when she joined Yahoo, she started spending a lot of money on purchasing startups in order to, to uh, uh, complete this long-term plan for Yahoo. Uh, after uh, several years, and a lot of money, uh, almost $3 billion, uh, invested in buying startups, uh, Yahoo still did not uh, show results, uh, and the money was running out. And then Meyer wanted to uh, change board policy to sell stocks of, of Alibaba and to use this money also for further investments. And this is when shareholders started to uh, intervene, and the manager of Starboard, Jeff Smith, who who is always accused of being like a short-termist uh, 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 investor who pressure managers for short-term profits, you know, said enough is enough. Uh, uh, if you want to spend so much money, you need to uh, justify that or distribute some to uh, shareholders. And then uh, he intervened in the company, uh, again, in, in a way that hedge funds do, uh, demanding more distribution of, of capital to shareholders, uh, and so forth, was blamed for uh, having, creating long-term pressures on uh, the company. Um, but the spending continued uh, for a while until it was uh, clear that uh, there are uh, no uh, good results of this. And then uh, eventually uh, Maya succumbed and, and um, we know the end. Uh, Yahoo core assets were sold to uh, Verizon uh, at four and a half billion. After all of that, Maya gave one interview uh, to Charlie Rose, uh, in which interview Charlie Rose asked, uh, here we are, and when you look at what has happened, what did you think went wrong, right? And the answer was, uh, well, I don't think the story has yet played out. Uh, a lot of tech turnarounds do take five, six, or seven years. So more time, the belief again was that more time is really what was needed here in order uh, to create a success. Now, uh, Yahoo's assets are now being uh, managed at Verizon uh, division owed by Tim Armstrong, who was, uh, uh, the C who was at AOL before he came to Verizon. And Tim Armstrong himself also had this baby long-term project called the Patch. The Patch was a um, website, local website for local news. That was the idea. Again, it was a long time ago. It's a little bit similar to Facebook uh, tailored uh, news. And uh, uh, Armstrong believed so much in the patch that he conditioned his joining AOL from Google on AOL acquiring the patch. And he continued uh, investing in the patch in AOL, again, throwing a lot of money into that, again, having hedge fund activists intervening uh, and starting to question this investment in the in patch. Uh, Armstrong fought for uh, Patch, uh, and uh, at the last minute, before the proxy fight with the hedge fund activist, uh, Armstrong conceded on the Patch issue and promised shareholders that uh, if the Patch is not becoming profitable in a year, he's going to abandon the project, and this is how he also uh, won uh, the proxy uh, fight. After this promise, uh, Armstrong uh, was uh, holding a conference uh, call, a meeting about the patch. Uh, Armstrong is really uh, uh, considered um, a great leader with, with great leadership uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, and this co conference call has turned to be a, a, a viral conference call uh, because during the call, he became extremely emotional and uh, fired an employee uh, during the conference call in front of uh, 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 thousands of employees from the uh, company. Uh, so, and this is really uncharacteristic uh, for Armstrong, but, but he was so invested in the patch and it was so difficult for him to abandon the project that his response uh, uh, came as a result of that. Now, again, looking back, uh, being asked, uh, uh, 
by an interviewer, what's the one thing that you would have changed looking back? Uh, he's going again back to the patch. Uh, and he's saying, you know, we, we, we got a lot of criticism there, and, but we kind of ignored it. We didn't look at incoming data. We had to look at more data. This is uh, probably what uh, you should do, uh, and we didn't uh, do that enough. In both cases, it was hedge fund activists who intervened and, and uh, limited the investment in uh, these projects. And uh, this is what we would describe as short-term pressure. And our, again, the argument is that sometimes this short-term pressure might be limiting uh, these overconfident investments uh, that uh, are not valuable for uh, shareholders. So, uh, what are the implications of that? Uh, the implications, again, are that the picture is not that black and white. There are also problems with uh, long-term investments. There could be a long-term bias. Managers might tend to overestimate these long-term dreams. Uh, and uh, because of that, the short-term pressure from investors and from the market, even if it's biased, even if it's uh, motivated by other sources, uh, might, at some cases, be limiting uh, long-term uh, bias. Uh, it, it has a role in some of these cases. And because of that, our job is actually more difficult. We cannot just... Uh, put as a goal to protect the long-term investments and to limit short-termism uh, because we need to find out more. We need to have more data about when is long-term good, when it's uh, harmful, and, and the same for uh, short-term pressure. Um, and there are several regulations now that are on the table in order to limit uh, short-term pressures, including uh, limiting hedge funds. These regulations were uh, were drafted under the assumption that long term is optimal. Uh, and uh, because it's not, we need to kind of look more into data and see if, if they are, are justified. Uh, but again, uh, just to qualify this, uh, we are not thinking that all hedge fund activism is optimal. We are not thinking that uh, um, long term projects always should uh, be. Uh, limited by the markets. Uh, for sure, there are some long-term projects that have value, and, and uh, many times these projects are projects that shareholders might not understand. Uh, and um, as a result, our job is just going to be more uh, difficult. We don't have easy answers, unfortunately. I'm out of time, or? Yes, okay, so thank you. <laughs>